2016, uh, Chris got associated with uh, Waveline Sports and he is enthusiastic about helping children develop their swimming skills, which has a lot of benefits besides a focused training. Please put your hand together to the half, Mr. Christopher Jacobs and Jeff. Let me have you on sir. stage, please. Thank you very much. Good morning. I just wanted to make sure it was still morning, not afternoon yet. Thank you very much for having me here today. I'll speak for a couple of moments. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if anyone has any questions, please ask them. I'm happy to answer anything. Uh, so, I first came to India probably 13, 14 years ago and met my wife who grew up here and started coming here when we were dating and been coming here ever since. So I've had a, a long-lasting relationship with the country and almost feel like a, a naturalized citizen. Um, from the very beginning, I noticed a big difference between swimming in the United States, swimming in India, and I've always been very interested in hoping at some point to be able to help India in some capacity improve its stature within the, the swimming community. There's absolutely no reason that you know, it shouldn't be the case. Several years ago, Mohsen Kazi from Waveline Sports contacted me. I had a strange little listing on a website in India just for lessons that appear three or four times a year and most had reached out to me about something and we started staying in touch becoming friendly and this is around a year ago we started working together uh, after meeting Mosin I was immediately impressed with the way that his group Waveline Sports has been approaching swimming in India. When I had first started speaking with people about the sport a long time ago, and perhaps starting a charity event, like something I'm involved in in the United States that raises money for cancer research for a lot of the better hospitals, people started telling me, not too many people in India really know all that much about swimming and not too many people care about swimming in India. Obviously it's you know, cricket, 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 and then you know, badminton and some other sports are, are slowly picking up steam. So it seemed that the, the way to get people involved in swimming in this country is starting very grassroots, and Mosin's approach is, is brilliant, and it's educating people that it's a life skill that people need to learn how to swim, obviously, so they don't drown. It's very important that everyone needs to know how to swim. Then the next step would be as fitness. It's a great form of exercise. People are becoming more focused on, on fitness as well. But if they enjoy this fitness, then it can become something they do for fun, and then obviously lead to competitive swimming. So my fondness for Mosin and his group and my respect for what he's been doing has been growing. So I'm always nagging him. I want to do more with him and more with him because I really believe in this program. So because of him, I'm, I'm here today. I've been doing a number of clinics, I guess over the last nine months to a year through Waveline and we've been meeting with you know, lots of kids, lots of adults, starting with the very basic learn to swim element and now he's introducing more of a competitive, a competitive program. And, and so that's it for, for Waveline. I started in a very similar way to what he's doing, just the most basic, almost like a get wet program. And in the US, they'll call it sort of mommy and me, where uh, a new mother will take her baby with guidance and splash them in the water. And the child becomes familiar with the water, perhaps the mother does as well. 
and then it progresses from there into basic swim instruction. Um, I really love spending time in the water. Um, we were working with a group just the other day, and I was working also with all of Mosin's coaches, and one of my biggest messages for any coach in any sport really is that, you know, you have to keep it fun. It has to be fun for the children. I was looking at the kids splashing around in the water the other day, and you, know, you see their smiles, and they're happy. They're in the water when it's very hot outside. How could you not be happy? And, you know, it's, it's a wonderful sport. It's great for your body, it's great for your mind. One of the, I don't know, it's not resistance to the sport, but obviously it's a big cultural difference between here and the U.S. And if I make references to the U.S., it's not a judgment, it's purely a, just a, a notation of, you know, historical values and differences. Academics obviously are always top, top, top priority here and always have been. My wife grew up here and moved to the U.S. when she was 18 and so we always have healthy debates about balance and you know, sports in a child's life and, and all of that. And so now we have lots of friends in the U.S. We actually live in London right now. We've been there for a year and a half. And lots of our friends who she grew up with in Mumbai have children who are becoming college age. They're all amazing students, and so many of them are finding out too that when they apply to some of these schools in the U.S., the universities are saying, wow, you are wonderful and you're brilliant. We also are seeing a lot of wonderful and brilliant students do you have any other interests outside of, of that? And all of our friends are starting to realize that you know, sort of that healthy balance is important as well. Obviously, academics have to be the top priority for anyone, but then developing that interest in a sport or in an instrument or something that gives a little more balance and is perhaps an outlet away from the classroom you know, it's critically important as well. I'm starting to see that that is, is changing slowly but definitely as I speak to parents at events like this and at different swim clinics. So when I started swimming, I was little in a splash around program, and then I swam on a team that just practiced in the summertime, maybe one hour a day, five days a week. And then I joined a team when I was 13 years old. It was very competitive. And children appreciate this story a little bit more than parents sometimes, but I'll, I'll tell it anyway. I was 13 years old. I had just joined a team. And I used to play around a lot of practice. I used to goof off. I would go down to the bottom and watch everyone swim by. If I was tired, and pull on the lane lines. I was cheating a lot. And I went into the locker room one day after practice, and I guess I probably weighed definitely under 50 kilos, maybe probably closer to 40 kilos. I didn't break 100 pounds until I was almost 14 years old. I was very, 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 very skinny. And one of my teammates was one of these guys who matured probably when he was 10. He was built like that, giant chest, giant arms. And we were in the locker room and he said something to me and I said something back to him and he pushed me and I pushed him back. And then with one hand, he grabbed me by my throat, lifted me off the ground, slammed me against the locker. I was scared to death at that point. And he told me, he said, your parents make you come here every day. You're here for two hours every day. You are an idiot because you're wasting all of this time. So he was very evolved, apparently, physically and spiritually, because he recognized the value of time and not wanting to waste it. And it's very funny because, you know, as we all know, our parents will tell us something, or our spouse will tell us something. 
and it goes in one ear and out of the other, but one day you'll hear the same exact thing from a friend or a colleague. You'll go home and you'll say, hey, I heard this brilliant thing today, and your, your friend or your spouse will say, I've been telling you that for the last five years, like, how did you finally get it? But at the age of 13, I understood what my friend said, and literally from that moment on, I never pulled on another lane line and worked out, I never cheated again, I realized that I had to make the most of it every minute that I had. I started working really hard, and I really was able to see results, and started swimming on, on better swim teams, I went to University of Texas in Austin, where you know, it was a wonderful school, and I had a fantastic coach who was very much like a father. He wasn't a screamer, he would always explain things to you. I was speaking to swimmers the other day, and some of them were up to 17 years old, some were very little. And most often a coach will say, okay, this is what you're all doing today, sort of ready, go. But my coach in Texas, and I went and visited him about two months ago and sat with him for an hour on the pool deck while he was coaching you know, the new crop of 18 to 21 year olds at the school. And he would have maybe two or three people in each lane and he'd walk up and he's 78 years old now. Just won the national championships again. Amazing coach, but he'd walk up to each child and give them something to do individually and go to the next lane and the next lane and the next lane and just so in tune with each person and what they needed to do to become better. And you know, I'm working with most of those coaches here and you know, most of them seem to completely understand that and I watch the way that they, they work with kids and it's about you know, making sure that they retain the love of the sport and have fun and, and have all the tools to improve all the time. You know, hopefully have sort of the same advantages that I had when I was starting out and developing. That's one of the highlights of my, my swimming life was swimming at the Olympics in 1988 um, at Olympic trials in the US. Very, very competitive, exciting meet. I've gone to all of the Olympic trials in the US for the last, I guess, 12 years just to watch. And they are so much fun and so much exciting. There's so many fast swimmers. And it's a thrill to go there. When I made the Olympic team, I made the Olympic team for the 100 freestyle and the freestyle relay. And I was thrilled, it was wonderful. My parents were going, so it was going to be a, you know, just great as in Seoul, Korea, somewhere I'd never been before, a very interesting culture. But when I got to the Olympics, after I had swum the 100 freestyle, the coaches all got together and decided that because my performance had been better than someone else's in a related event. They were going to give me another event to swim, which was wonderful. So it, I was able to swim the 100 freestyle on the end of the medley relay. The medley relay is backstroke, breaststroke, butterfly, freestyle. Everyone always considers the, the last leg to be the, the most exciting and sort of the glory leg. I had never swum it in my life because my starts were so horrible. My leg stuck to the starting block. I had an impossible time getting off quickly. It's always a joke that I, I was the fastest person in the water, but I couldn't get off the block. But I had an opportunity to swim that in the last event of swimming at the Olympics. It was my birthday as well. So imagine having that as a birthday present. And it was my 24th birthday at the 24th Olympics. So just so great and so lucky and fortunate and, and blessed. You know, I was one of the swimmers. You no, know, I look at swimmers, I look at other sports. I think when you get to a certain point, everyone works really, really hard. Everyone thinks they work harder than everyone else. 
but not everyone is, is lucky. I mean, even if you work hard and do everything perfectly, sometimes you have a bad day. I was incredibly fortunate. Things have worked out really well for me at the right moment in time. So I, I feel very fortunate about that. I'll say one more thing about, about swimming and sports and training and all of that. And I speak to lots and lots of kids my entire life. I'll tell you from the time I was probably 15, uh, and I've been giving swimming lessons, working with teams, working with different countries. Um, in my weekends and evenings, I, I had a career in finance also that lasted about 20 years, it's very interesting. Uh, I was able to apply a lot of the tools that I learned in swimming in that. But the Olympics are, they were great, they were fun, but for me the Olympics were just the biggest feat that I had ever been to. So when I speak to kids, you know, they're talking about setting goals, well I want to go to the Olympics or I want to go to this, and I'll say, you know, what is the biggest meet you've ever been to? And it might be, you know, the biggest meet was my meet at the swimming pool last week, or it might be, you know, the Maharashtra Championships or some sort of state meet. But I would say the Olympics for me was, was that meet, it was the next meet. So something like the Olympics, they're not the be all and end all. It's always just trying to get better and doing the best that you can do. Always being prepared to do well. One final little quick story and then I'll stop and hopefully someone will ask a question. After the Olympics, so I described the Olympics, my 24th birthday, everything was perfect. We won a gold medal, broke a world record on that relay. And smart money would have said, quit while you're ahead because I had had two shoulder surgeries and elbow surgery already. My body was very much sort of just getting banged up and you know, falling apart a little bit. But I thought, I can do anything. I will hang on another four years, go to the next Olympics, won't that be wonderful? And swimmers were just starting to get a little fame and glory in the sport. You know, when I was swimming, there was sort of that much of it. Now there's, you know, thanks to Michael Phelps, people around the world appreciate swimming a lot more. I mean, he did the most amazing thing for the, for the sport. It's part of everyone's vocabulary now. It never had been. So after the Olympics, I took just about a year off. I spent a lot of time in Europe. I did a lot of traveling, swam at a couple of meets. I worked out not at all, not at once. And then I went back to my home pool in Texas and told my coach there that, hey, I want to start training again because world championships were the next year. And I thought if I make it to world championships, then it's only two more years till the Olympics. I wasn't hungry anymore. I hadn't reset my goals. I had I sort of reached one of my big goals. And I had developed a little bit of a you know, an athletic ego. I felt like I could be good enough just to qualify for something. And so I'd swim a little bit, I'd miss a lot of workouts, I wasn't nearly as disciplined as I had been. And I came to this swimming, these world championship trials, and it was at my my home pool. When I say my home pool, I mean my my pool is at the, my regular pool at the University of Texas. And I swam the 100 freestyle in the morning, and I was next to one of my best friends. The University of Texas had a lot of very good swimmers, so I was next to a guy I was training with all the time. And little by little, he was starting to beat me in practice all the time. He beat me in kicking sets, and I'd say, "Okay, well, I can beat him in a pull set." Then in the pole set, he'd beat me, and I'm like, uh oh, I have to beat him in something to be able to beat him in races. So we get to trials, we swim next to each other. I think it's funny how I've actually blocked a lot of these memories. I think I qualified third going into finals. Third would make the world championship team. You wouldn't swim in an individual event, only the top two would. So I went back to my hotel, I slept, I thought, okay, I'll go back tonight, I'll beat my friend. 
hopefully I'll win, I'll go to world championships and live happily ever after, then go to the next Olympics. So I got to the pool that night and I got up on the blocks and I just didn't feel connected. All of you know that whether you feel connected for an exam, I've studied as hard as I can, as smart as I can, and I'm going to ace it. Or preparing for any other event, public speaking, I'm prepared to get up and, and talk to a group of people. So I got up on the blocks, you know, take your marks, go, and my head just wasn't in it. And I was doing stupid things. And in a sport like swimming, which is very repetitious and can be like painfully boring sometimes, I was breathing when I shouldn't be breathing. I wasn't on autopilot. If you practice perfectly, and I was speaking the other day about this, everyone works hard. The people who win are the ones who work smart. You want to work hard, act smart, but you always have to be thinking. And I'll, I'll tell people to do things a certain way, and so if you do it enough, when it comes time for a race, you can pretty much shut your mind off as far as technique goes, and just focus on getting to that end before someone else does. But when you don't practice the right stuff over and over and over, you do silly things. So, the race I was swimming, it was down and back. Funny, not, not so much longer than this room, but down and back. And I was definitely aware of my position. Other people were ahead of me going into the turn. I went into the turn, I pushed off, I took a breath, and I thought, you are so stupid, what did you just do? You took a breath. Because I never used to do that. I used to practice all the time. I would take a minimum of four strokes off of every wall before I would take a breath. Otherwise, a giant wave comes and hits you in the head when you take a breath and you stop in the water. And so I was questioning myself, doubting myself, looking at other people. I was scrambling, trying to get back to the other end. I touched the wall. I looked up and I saw a number seven next to my lane. Seven, which would be next to last. And I sort of went back down in the water again and I thought, surely that can't be. And I pulled myself up and looked again at the scoreboard and yes, there it was, a big number seven next to my, next to my lane, which meant I definitely wasn't going to world championships. Um, and then I had, in my mind, failed miserably. And I remember getting up and I pretty much ran into the locker room and I went into a stall in the bathroom and I definitely cried. It was very emotional. And you know, I was very unhappy about that for a long time. And you know, as you become older and you learn more and you think more and realize what you could have done differently, the reason that I was upset and the biggest life lesson that I took from that at the age of 25 was, this is something I tell kids all the time, if you prepare for something perfectly, if you do all of the work, and it's funny because I asked, at the first time I ever spoke to a, a young group of kids and swimmers in India, I was so impressed, I got goosebumps, I, called my wife immediately because I got the most brilliant, evolved answers from little tiny kids that I had ever gotten from anyone else, anywhere in the world, at any age. But I asked these kids, I said, if you have a race coming up, or an exam coming up, and you've done all of the work for it, you've prepared perfectly, you've been smart, and you've addressed every issue, you've practiced perfectly, and you don't get the result that you were after, are you happy, or are you sad, or are you miserable? And this, and I asked a bunch of kids, and this, I was almost reluctant to point to this little boy, because I thought of a very, like, you know, I'd be 
be so, you know, miserable that I, I could all cry like a 25 year old. And he stood up and he said, well, I think I'd be okay that I would go home and I would work harder and try and get that same result the next time. Amazing, brilliant dancer. Because, and I realized that about myself, that had I done everything perfectly that entire year leading up to that swim meet when I got seventh, and then I got seventh, I would have been okay with it because I would have known that at that moment in time, I did the best that I was capable of doing. I had prepared perfectly, and it just, you know, it wasn't meant to be, and I would have been fine. And since that time in my life, obviously I've fallen short of some personal expectations in different areas, but it's fine. And you know that you have to work harder, you know, or maybe this is the best that you can do, you know, for you, physically, mentally, whatever. But that was my biggest lesson. It's, it's working smart, it's always preparing perfectly for everything. And then you will be you know, happy and satisfied. So thank you everyone for having me here today. I'd love to answer some questions. Absolutely, anything at all.